Welcome in once again to the Fresh Off the Podcast, where we'll consistently dive into personalized insights and entertainment discussions from me and my future guests when I, whenever I have them on, you know, about many different topics and aspects of life that you can't find anywhere else. We're here to feed that endless eternal content addiction. You guys already know. Today, we have our episode three. My love story for trading card games. Shout out to the Fresh Off The Press family and our YouTube channel. Man, I wouldn't be here without you guys. If by any chance you guys have been living under a rock and haven't subscribed yet to our YouTube channel, then make sure you guys at least check out our description down below. Make sure you guys go over there and destroy that subscribe button, guys, as it does really help out. And it really means a lot to me. You guys are the straight MVPs. All right, guys, so without any further ado, let's get started with today's episode, which will be all about my Yu-Gi-Oh! love story, man. Just that passion that I have for for the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game, yes. At times, it can definitely be a love-hate relationship. Nothing's perfect, guys, and Yu-Gi-Oh! is far from it as well. But at the same time, it's definitely been a major part of my childhood life. And I want to go ahead and share my personal story with you guys today. In this episode, I'm going to go ahead and talk about how and why I got into Yu-Gi-Oh! The trials and tribulations throughout the years with the game, my small time competitive experience, my casual collector angle of things, and talk a little bit about the money that I have been able to generate with this hobby that I just love so much, guys. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and immediately start you know, just with my story, you know, with the question essentially of today's episode, the main question, what inspired, you know, you to start playing Yu-Gi-Oh at such a young age? That's the question that I'll be answering today. So, man, let's just go down memory lane, um, join the ride with me and uh, the roller coaster ride with me. And I really do appreciate it, guys. So I was seven. I was seven years old, by the way. Um, when I was first introduced to the game, so let's get started. My love for Yu-Gi-Oh! honestly was born when I was a kid, and Konami, or whoever was the parent company at the time of Yu-Gi-Oh! at the time, came out with the first ever Yu-Gi-Oh! cards from the first ever sets. It's crazy to think about it in that way, um, but I was actually there at the beginning of when it all started. I was there for the release of the first Yu-Gi-Oh! products, but I just didn't know what it all truly meant back then being a kid, you know? Overall, that's where my inspiration stemmed from. Definitely the nostalgia factor and just being present since the origins of Yu-Gi-Oh! Also, apart from my obvious love and passion for the game, I'm always investing into Yu-Gi-Oh! Always buying and selling Yu-Gi-Oh! cards, always trading cards left and right, always making moves, always making plays. So I just wanted to put what I already do out there for the world to consume and hopefully for people to just be able to at least find some value and entertainment in what I do. Contrary to how most people probably got to interact with Yu-Gi-Oh for the first time in their lives, I did not start playing or buying cards due to the anime. Honestly, come to think of it, I've never even seen the full anime nor know the full extent of the Yu-Gi-Oh lore per se. My love for the game exclusively initiated from just playing and trading card cards with friends and family members. As a kid, I weirdly never felt attracted to that connection with the anime, really, even to this day. And I have no clue why, because the anime is simply amazing, especially the first um, couple of seasons. Um, but yeah, even to this day, I, 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 you know, I haven't felt that connection per se. I did watch a couple of episodes with my wife and my daughter, and we had a blast. But midway through, you know, the family quit on me. So I'm gonna have to finish, you know, watching the anime by myself at a later time. I mean, again, like I said, I've seen sporadic episode episodes throughout the years here and there, but not enough to actually follow the timeline or fully know the story of the anime in its full extent. I feel like nowadays I barely have time to sit through the anime and live that amazing experience. But that's something, like I said, again, that I'm looking forward to eventually doing whenever it does end up happening down the line. All right, guys. So I want to now move on to my actual life story about my journey through Yu-Gi-Oh's inception into my life and being able as a kid to be there in the earliest of days, just living that experience. So next up, we'll dive into the chronological order of events that has led me to become who I am today and just the love that I got for this game. All right, let's get it, guys. Let's get it, man. I'm super excited. I appreciate you guys listening in, you know, um, throughout this journey with me. And, uh, man, yeah, make sure you 
subscribe on spotify i'm more follow as well as on youtube i really do appreciate it. all right guys so my love for trading card games started way back in the late 1990s man i'm a yugi boomer man oh man mm -mm -mm. definitely have been around the block for a while so guys just even trying to remember all about this you know the brain fog kicks in and memories get a bit blurry down memory lane, but here we go. It was back in early 1998. Man, oh man. The early days of Jay. Manhattan, New York. Again, as a young Jay uh, that was about seven years young at the time. Man, I went to PS 187 in second grade. You know, shout out to the peeps up there north in New York, in New York man. Those were the days second grade and uh yeah i was a good student as always i used to love recess man um those were good times uh those were the days if it wasn't t taking a crack at a sport then it was peeking into the group of kids playing the latest and greatest release which at the time were trading card games oh boy it was again boy was it a novelty back in the day both pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh tcg releases went viral back when when, back then, without any social media, cell phones, or or even the internet existing as it does today. Every kid uh, was either talking about the latest and greatest or wanted to buy such cards for themselves. It was the fever of the moment, but boy, Jay was broke at the time. Man, oh man. I had no allowance and with no apparent way to get access to the new shiny cardboard. I had to sit back and just dream. That same year, opportunity then eventually came um, you know, my way via my cousins. I had two cousins living in the Bronx, New York. They got, they got access, early access to some of these cards. And uh, yeah, they would provide me with some of the cheap comments to get started with. So at first, Pokemon was the talk of the town. Charizard came into the scene and just snatched most kids' hearts. Everyone wanted to play Pokemon, including my cousins, and no one was really paying too much attention to Yu-Gi-Oh! at the time. Also, Pikachu, man, just Pikachu, Charizard, Pokemon, it took over. So that, that's just, that's the way it was back in the day. Eventually, I even built my first scrub Pokemon deck, just barely scraping by and was having fun playing Pokemon and actually playing with the cards. Eventually, I started winning matches and winning cards out of my cousins and friends at school. That's one thing that has certainly changed from the game back then to now, guys. We used to play for cards, man. High stakes, high rewards. Let's get it. You know, and due to this, I eventually had a solid deck and even learned the art of trading. So back in the day, it was the Wild Wild West, man. We used to, you know, um, um, just go for people's cards. You know what I mean? Just bet cards here and there. Um, you know, in essence, gambling, you know, to a certain extent. But again, those were the early days. And as a kid, you got to find ingenious ways to get access to cards you need, but you got no money for. So you had to play your way into greatness, essentially. So those were the good days, man. I just have a laugh because those were good times. My reign with Pokemon was just getting started. I was cooking folks left and right, dominating my cousins and friends, and I was in love with Pokemon. When all of a sudden, a couple of months later, one random day, I swing by my cousin's house to continue pooping on them. Uh, and when I came up to them, I see these brown pieces of cardboard laying on the hallway floor. Um, and I was stunned at the time. Yu-Gi-Oh had a reputation of being the whack TCG. I never really cared about it much until then either. Um, so to my surprise, when I went up to my cousins as usual to play some Pokemon, they just looked up to me and asked, bro, are you serious right now? And I'm like, what do you guys mean? They asked me, are you really still into Pokemon, man? I'm like, of course. Why wouldn't I? And they told me, man, Pokemon is old news, bro. Yu-Gi-Oh is where it's at right now. And I'm like, no way. Yu-Gi, what? What did you just say? Stop it, guys. Come on now. Snap out of it. Then they said, come on, man. Just sit down and watch. Give it a shot and learn how to play so you can see how fun it is. Honestly, at first I was skeptical about trying out a new TCG as I was plainly in love with Pokemon and felt like some type of emotional betrayal inside of me if I would switch over to Yu-Gi-Oh, you know? I thought Yu-Gi-Oh was plain and boring at the time, you know, just vanilla monsters and this and that and the other, and I didn't really, you know, read too much into it on that specific day. Each time I went back to my cousins, though, we played less and less Pokemon until one day I found myself owning some ha some hand-me-down Yu-Gi-Oh cards that I could create a new deck with. Eventually, the playability of Yu-Gi-Oh grew into me more than Pokemon, and eventually Pokemon just became a nostalgia-based TCG where I only focus on the co collectability aspect of it instead of its lackluster playability. At that moment, 
my Yu-Gi-Oh journey officially began. It was extremely hard and challenging to accumulate the good cards as a kid, but playing for cards in, tra in the trade hustle eventually got me to a point where three years later, I would win my first ever Yu-Gi-Oh tournament, guys. Three years later. Three years later. Wow. Hey, I mean, th those were the struggle back then. I mean, you know what I mean? I had to wait three years, um, you know, in order to get the cards that I needed. But again, we can skip to Manhattan, New York in late 2001. Three years had passed where little by little I was getting the cards that I needed to build the best version of my deck, which was GOAT Control inspired. Mind you, there was no ban list back then. And people played decks like Chamber and Deck, Mill Out, Warrior, and GOAT themed slash inspired decks. I mean, again, the Wild Wild West. Any cash I could get from birthdays or holidays slash family gifts would go towards the cards that I needed. Trading and playing for cards helped me immensely, though. I had to risk it for the biscuit, as they say, even if I was putting some of my own cards on the line sometimes. Eventually, again, I felt ready to take my talents to South Beach like LeBron. Man, I wanted to test myself against others and take the challenge head on, and that's when I remember that I participated um, in my first Yu-Gi-Oh! tournament ever. After a couple of, of, of rounds, I was undefeated and made it to the finals uh the finals were an epic clash between similar decks the mirror match went to game three where i clutched it out by a thin hair it was crazy and an awesome experience for me as a kid i won first place at that new york store tournament um in manhattan around like 164 i think it was man god man the memories they just 164th uh, i think it was like broadway with uh man i don't even guys man those were the days I clutched it out. We brought it home as, a, you know, I think I was like 13 or something like that. Man, man, oh, man, or 10 or something. I, I just know I was pooping on kids. Those were good times, man. <laughs> Honestly, hopefully you're getting the raw emotion of your boy, Jay. I just, I'm smiling right now, just talking about those good old days. But yeah, again, I won first place at that store tournament, and the prize was a choice between a cash prize or what today is referred to an iPod as an iPod classic. It was an over $300 prize, and as a kid at that time, that was huge to me. Um, and again, is it me or is it crazy, you know, to, to think that uh, it feels like everything back then was just better? You know what I mean? Like, imagine hundreds of dollars worth of prizes if you go play Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, that'd be insane today, right? So... Again, cash prizes handed out by Yu-Gi-Oh! shops. Y'all imagine? Ooh, nowadays, man, man. On top of everything, I had escaped from my mom without permission to attend the tournament. I told her that I would go to the grocery store to grab some snacks, you know, and I ended up staying and winning the tournament. After a couple of hours had gone by, she freaked out and she was searching for me everywhere. Mind you, there were no cell phones back then, so you know, things were definitely different. She eventually got to me, though, and she was perplexed but surprised that I had done what I did and won that event. Uh, winning that prize helped me a lot, though, and not getting grounded, obviously. Thank God I won that tournament. That was the highlight of my Yu-Gi-Oh! career as a kid. And then, sadly, in the later years, I passed by that same spot where that store used to be, and unfortunately, it was there no more. Eventually... Guys, we got to the point where I had to quit Yu-Gi-Oh. You know what I mean? I just, I had to quit um, because I moved to and lived in the Dominican Republic for the rest of my formative years. So the only exposure that I really got to Yu-Gi-Oh for those years was by playing in middle school and throughout high school with friends attempting to relive that epic experience I had as a kid in that tournament play that I mentioned. And as the years passed by, I always had that itch inside of me to return to play, to trade, and to collect the TCG that I love so much, but could not do so, as I did not live in the States anymore. Um, and even though there was a local shop, you know, once in my town, um, you know, but all cards were in Spanish, um, and the experience just did not feel the same, you know, so I did keep my old cards in collection with me, even though it was minimal due to insufficient funds as a child, you know, and one of my DR cousins also robbed me of some of my cards, but that's a story for another day, uh, another day. I did keep my deck though. So that's the positive. I kept my, my deck intact. So that was pretty nice. And uh, again, there's only so much capital you can acquire usually as a little kid to obtain cards. So my collection was never massive in the first place. But again, like I said, I managed to keep my goat deck intact. So it did feel good um, to know that I still had my favorite deck with me. Even though I didn't end up moving back to the States for many, many years, I did manage to find a way to still expose myself to the Yu-Gi-Oh scene while growing up in my teen years. This is where the beautiful island of Puerto Rico 
comes into play. In my early teen years, my dad used to work for USPS in the island's capital, San Juan, Puerto Rico. I used to go visit every summer to spend some time with him. And if you guys anything about if you guys know anything about PR and the Yu-Gi-Oh scene is that it's always on fire down there, man, even back in the day. The main spot back in the day was Plaza Las Americas, a massive mall where Yu-Gi-Oh locals were held at. Those were definitely fun times, and I would always anxiously wait for the summer months so I can go over there and at least be exposed to the Yu-Gi-Oh scene, even if for a bit, at least once a year. Summer after summer, I would go and trade, play for cards, compete in the tournaments, and meet new people while absorbing that amazing Yu-Gi-Oh scene and um, experience, guys. So again, time never stopped and continued on all those years, and as I grew up, I played less and less Yu-Gi-Oh, until unfortunately, due to life circumstances and growing up um, away from the States, I eventually quit Yu-Gi-Oh for many many years, even into adulthood. My interest for Yu-Gi-Oh! resurged in 2015. Ten years had passed, and I felt like a noob again, like a baby trying to walk for the first time. After so many years completely out of the game, missing out on Heroes, Edison Format, and so many other great eras of Yu-Gi-Oh!, I came back to a totally new and different game. Most of us Yu-Gi-Oh! players have quit at some point throughout our lives, but what truly matters is that we always find a way to get back into Yu-Gi-Oh!, uh, to feed uh, that endless eternal Yu-Gi-Oh cardboard addiction, guys. So, again, I then found myself in 2015 living in Canada out of, man, I was in DR, in the States first, Canada. I've been all over the place where I bought my first Yu-Gi-Oh product in more than a decade. I was up there in the cold with the snow and with the newborn baby as well. My beautiful daughter. Shout out, man. She's a straight MVP. Um, but again, life was hectic. But I finally found a way after all those years to go to a Toys R Us nearby and just buy me a random Yu-Gi-Oh product to remind myself of the good old days, man, to mentally relive the good times of my childhood and teen years. I bought one of the mini boxes that brought an ultimate rare dark magician as a promo, if I'm not mistaken, which was pretty cool. I won't lie. I had no clue what the state of the game was at the time but all i know is that it felt good to smell that fresh cardboard once again after that experience not much else happened until i moved out of canada that same year finally moved back to the states back to orlando florida um again after all those years away uh, i started again i was back in the states and, and it felt good again i started little by little buying some some cards just based on nostalgia and things of that nature had no clue about the meta or what none of that stuff was at the time first deck i picked up not knowing what in the world i was doing was light swarms it immediately became my favorite deck just loved the mill and luck aspect of it and jd just snatched my heart i was scrub city though but started to get the gist of things by starting to go to locals whenever i found a chance in 2016 i started watching house of champs and ygo paisano so again shout out to them peeps all credit goes to them for all the great work you know they've done um uh for the Yu-Gi-Oh market watch community um excuse me guys those guys are just they're great at what they do um and uh yeah hopefully we, we can maybe collab one day who knows that that'd be pretty exciting but again based on their knowledge i decided to start my own Yu-Gi-Oh investment journey i started buying cards that wow they were really cheap back in those days like OC Colossal Fighter, for example, for 25 bucks. And now it's a triple digi card and things of that nature. So while making small investments, I also realized that competitively light swarms couldn't really do much um, anymore after their Edison days. So that's when I started my love for trap decks with Paleozoic Frogs. This was when I first started topping tournaments consistently. Man, did I poop on kids with that deck? Those were good times indeed. Broken deck at the time, man. Really had a good ride with it topping a lot and extracting a lot of value from the game, either via store credit or just cracking packs open after topping. When Dinos came out with OV Raptor and UCT, I finally felt like I could build a budget brand new, fresh off the press deck and just compete. Top many tournaments with that deck with the Yang Zing engine as well. Truly broken until the banlist came and cleaned up house. Man, that banlist came in and man, bye bye. It, it was tough. It was tough, guys. But hey, then True Dracos came out. It immediately became my favorite modern deck of all time. I just simply fell in love with the mechanic, the way it worked. Loved the anti meta feel to the deck, the tribute summoning. Even though it was literally a top tier meta deck, it felt just anti meta. If you get, you know what I mean. If you play True Dracos, man, it was amazing. Masterpiece took over the show for me. And I even took a pure version to the Kissimmee Regionals in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, and got 33rd place. 
33rd place, guys. That's crazy. Uh, and, and again, that was both the highlight and the demise of my competitive career. In summary, I felt like I really played well in that tournament, competed at the highest of levels. Finally thought I would top a regionals and uh, get my first regional invite um, again for the first time. And I just can't believe that I was just one spot away, man. It was truly heartbreaking. I won't lie. I couldn't believe it. And when I saw the results paper and saw my name at 33rd, just literally one spot away from topping as the event was a top 32 regionals, man, that, that hit me hard. It did. You couldn't have made that stuff up, man. And I've never been to a regionals ever since. Uh, so what is that in more than five years? Is, is, that's crazy, right? More than five years. I'm slacking. I need to start going to regionals. You know what I mean? Cause a lot goes on, not just the competitive aspect to it, but buying, selling cars. I mean, in the sense of trading, trading, that's what I meant to say. So, uh, it's always fun to trade with many different people people so on top of that experience the band list came and just nuked my favorite deck of all time leaving me clueless as to what i would play next i would cycle through Paleozo paleozoics and dinos once again to try to relive my past pinnacle experiences but eventually failed and got bored of playing the same old decks until eventually scrub terrors came into the fray taking over the scene as that next trap deck to play had amazing times at cool stuff water for lakes man you know, we had, again, an amazing Yu-Gi-Oh! ambiance there, man. Wow, met many great people, top many events there. Everyone knew me there, and I feel like that was a second home to me, man, until COVID hit and just wrecked everything, causing that store's permanent closure. When 2020 came, I was in shock as the world crumbled and everything change much to my surprise and unexpectedly that was what the year when my tcg player store that i had started over three years ago at the time as a side hustle just exploded and provided me an excess of over five figures worth of income for that calendar year i couldn't believe it guys honestly i just thought to myself everyone is is in lockdown and there's no Yu-Gi-Oh events physical Yu-Gi-Oh events going on right now so who in their right mind would want to buy Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Boy, was I wrong. The contrary happened and it seemed that people wanted something to hold on to during those trying times. And what better than to buy pieces of cardboard? <laughs> Shout out to my guy, Tyler, man. Tyler is a straight MVP who's always mentioning in the comment section about the PP loans, uh, you know, PPP loans, triple P's, the stimulus checks, <laughs> unemployment benefits, loaded EBT cards and student loan forgiveness yeah, program. <laughs> Government handouts, you name it, man. Tyler, Tyler is, is my guy, man. All those combined to become major inflows of capital into the Yu-Gi-Oh markets, making it go parabolic, just like the channel, and inflating overall card prices into oblivion. Those were good times indeed. Fast forward to 2023. Here, hey, here we are. And I've really been playing Scrub Terror since they came out. And that's crazy to think. Still in this same calendar year, I managed to top some local events here and there. And it's nice to see that I've been able to extract so much value out of this deck throughout the years. Due to the fact that thankfully the deck was never directly hit by the ban list. At the time of recorded, I have cycled towards Sprite Adventure Melfi's for the first... I'm sorry, for the time being. And let's see where that takes me. I believe after this one, I'll eventually uh, play some variant of Horus um, in 2024. So let's see. How that pans out. I have never, ever attended an A an AWCQ event before. And that's definitely in the cards to 2024, depending on, you know, location and things of that sort. And again, the channel is doesn't even have a year old. You know, it's not even a year old yet. So it'll be nice, you know, due to the channel and everything to maybe get to live that experience again. I want to go to my first regional soon. Um, in a year soon, uh, but at least I did finally get to go to my first YCS ever, and boy, what an event it was. Got to go to YCS Cancun in Mexico. It was epic to attend such a massive Yu-Gi-Oh event, especially internationally in that fashion. Episode 4 of the podcast will most likely be all about my YCS Cancun trip, so stay tuned for more details coming out soon. My current goal is to continue to expose myself to those massive events that offer those unique and complete Yu-Gi-Oh experiences. I see myself as a casual collector, not a hardcore collector. That's what I love about Yu-Gi-Oh! That it allows you to choose what area of the trading game you want to focus on and provides plenty of options. You can be casual, hardcore, competitive uh, collector. I'm sorry, collect cards, focus on trades, buying and selling cards, you name it. Or you can choose to essentially do it all as well, offering you, offering you a truly limitless and complete overall experience guys again in my opinion the yugi verse is mainly composed of buying selling and trading cards collecting cards and even playing the game casually or competitively 
just so many different ways to enjoy the game that all we love. So personally, my favorite aspect of Yu-Gi-Oh is to buy, sell, and trade cards. I prefer it even over collecting and or playing the trading card game itself. I do consider myself as a hybrid because I do it all, but if I had to choose one, trading would be where it's at for me. And that's what truly inspired me to create my Market Watch channel in the first place. Just that passion that I have for that specific part of the Yugi verse. As a conclusion to my story, guys, with regards to my 25 year journey with Yu Gi Oh! When ironically, this year Konami is celebrating Yu Gi Oh!'s 25th anniversary as well. The goal is to just put out there to the world what I've learned throughout my all my years of experience in all facets of Yu Gi Oh! and the hard work and research that it takes to get to that point where you can achieve success. I'm just glad that it's paying off with the success of the channel as the fresh off the press community continues to grow and expand rapidly. I sure hope that my story can serve not only as entertainment, but also as valuable experiences that can be seen as brief lessons to learn and know more about Yu Gi Oh! and other life experiences, man. What an episode today, guys. Guys, if you haven't done so already, don't forget to check out my different social networks in the description down below. We offer it all. We have long form content on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, and we also offer, offer short form content on our other platforms as well. You just never know, man. If the YouTube channel ever gets compromised, you want to make sure to always have access to your boy Jay from the fresh off the press community at all times. So make sure that you follow me um, and subscribe on all our other social media platforms all right man we get to my favorite part of the episode again guys in every episode i just like to provide advice for other content creators and for anyone out there um just listening so this tends to be my favorite part of these podcast episodes all right so today is all about no longer being standby guys take action come on now you know what i'm talking about you the person listening to this podcast you know what you need to do after you're done listening in. You know, you know, you know that you have a personal project. You need to start that business idea that you've been thinking about that YouTube channel that you've always wanted to start and get ahead, you know, to actually doing that road to the gym to create a healthy lifestyle, that career advancement. And, you know, just to do better at your job or just to get better with relationships and with those close to you and around you. There's always something that we want to get done, but we don't do. We don't even know why, right, guys? Always something we know we should do, but we always leave it for later. It's time to flip that. You know, it's time to flip that mindset. It's time to take action and get things done. The done mentality. Just get it done. It's time to make things happen and stop with all the talk. Anyone could talk, even two-year-olds, but not everyone can take action. Not everyone can make it happen. Not everyone can start and just jump into the unknown. Life is like bungee jumping. Usually most people at first have to think about it twice before jumping off the rails, but eventually they take action and just do it for the most part. Um, so again, right when they take the first step and jump off, most people regret it and even question their decision while they're on the way down. But eventually the rope kicks in and saves the day. Same with life. Just jump, take action, believe in yourself and the rope, meaning life itself, will come in and save the day, meaning that it will come in and make it all happen for you. Again, lastly, it all comes down to you. No one else can live your life or make the decisions that you for yourself need to make happen. Make it happen, no matter what the cost. Have that grit, that wherewithal from within to just make it because you can. Because you believe in yourself. Because you were meant to do so. All of you guys have so much potential. So much to offer to this world. Get to it. Take action and get it done. I believe in you guys. All right, guys. So again, F episode four um, is going to probably be uh, uh, titled I Got Next. It's my turn. I'm super excited for this one as I'll dive into my YCS Cancun trip. Yeah, it was, you know, over you know, a couple of months ago, but I'll go into the trip in detail while also discussing the real chances and probabilities of me becoming that next big Yu-Gi-Oh channel slash personality in the YouTube Yu-Giverse. Man, thank you so much for taking some of your precious time, guys, to listen in. And if you guys made it this far out into this podcast episode, you guys continue to be the straight MVPs. Guys, thank you so much for all the support that you provide here through the podcast, all the support that you guys provide through my YouTube channel. You know, I try and be everywhere, short form content, long form content, podcast episodes, even though we took a bit long for this one. You know, I, I wish, you know, the goal is to 
get these out more frequently, but there's a lot going on with the channel, a lot of things to get done, and this is just the beginning, guys. I'm super excited, you know, really, really grateful for you guys. Thank you so much, man, for your time, for your support, and for your attention. Stay fresh.